You're live. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Matt Harrington with the Southwestern Vermont Chamber of Commerce. And at this point, you have been joining us hopefully weekly as we update uh, all of you on this COVID crisis in multiple different ways, whether that's healthcare, uh, the economy, uh, tourism, HR, everything that we think both our business members and the community need to hear. We, uh, we have partnered with our friends over at CAT TV, and we have to say a big thank you to the staff there. Uh, some, some weeks we've done two of these. Uh, luckily, I think this week we've only done one, but we want to thank Mike Cutler uh, and the team over there at CAT TV for allowing us to, uh, to kind of take on their, their Zoom and for their help to broadcast live. Happy May, May 1st, everybody. We want to thank you for joining us. If you are watching on Facebook Live, uh, this is a little bit of an interactive uh, telecast. So if you do have questions for my guests today, please put comments in the, in the comment box there on Facebook, and I will be monitoring them and, and ask uh, those questions as well. I do have a bunch of questions here for our guests, so that'll keep us busy for some time. Uh, I'm very excited to have on the show today uh, the Vermont Chamber of Commerce and specifically their president, Betsy Bishop, uh, whom probably many of our members have interacted with in some way, uh, shape, or form, whether that be our legislative luncheons or just uh, the work that uh, Vermont Chamber has done in partnership with our chamber here. Uh, but I think it's great to be able to broadcast this to a larger community because anybody can watch on Facebook or on Cat TV. So for those of you that don't know, uh, Betsy Bishop, she's the president of the Vermont Chamber, and with her are two of her great staff members, Charles Martin, Government Affairs uh, Director, and Amy Spear, Vice President of Tourism. And I thought, you know, based on the title of today's show, we're really going to break uh, down this telecast in the three main buckets, and one of them is going to really focus around the economy and, and general business as it pertains to the COVID crisis. Uh, the governor just got done with another press conference today. So, Betsy, I'm sure you have updates for us and what we need to know. And then really going over to Charles and talking about the legislature, uh, mainly what have we done in terms of COVID relief and, and kind of uh, answering the, the call to COVID, but also what's going on in the legislature that uh, maybe we're not paying attention to because we're so concerned with COVID. So, Charles over at the Vermont Chamber has been keeping his ear to that. And then finally, we'll wrap up with tourism. Many of our members, and I'm sure all over Vermont, people are wondering uh, how and when do we turn on Vermont? And then how do we get people back here to travel to our, our inns and our lodging, our restaurants and to our attractions? And so Amy's going to give us an update with that. So first, and, and obviously the guests can uh, can hop in on, on each other's conversations because I know you all work together. But maybe just a quick introduction from all three of you, a little bit of your background, and then we'll get into the questions. And, and we'll start with the with the president herself, uh, Betsy Bishop. Thank you, Matt, for having us and for hosting us. This is this is fabulous, and I think we're all learning to work from home and uh, talk from home and reach out to even larger audiences. So um, I think it's important in this time of uncertainty. It really puts a fine point on why chambers are incredible uh, community organizations to really be there in the time of need. It's it's been, uh, you know, certainly crisis communications as we go uh, with everything is really uh, COVID-19 at, at this point, and we're, we're really uh, focused on that. Um, by way of background, many of you do know me. I've been at the Vermont Chamber for over a decade now in this, in this role. I've been working in, uh, you know, being a business advocate pretty much my entire career, uh, both in government and outside of government, and really focused on making sure that there's a growing and thriving economy in Vermont and that businesses are set up to be a part of that. Great. Uh, Charles. Give us a little bit of your background. Uh, you've joined the Vermont Chamber over the last couple of years, uh, have come to a couple of our legislative uh, luncheons, but what's your background and what's your take on the current situation? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so I've been with the Chamber two years now. Before that, I was a Senate staffer and spent some time in the military prior to that. Um, I think Betsy kind of covered it well, but I, I will say it's, it's an interesting time. I, I'm used to working in the legislative space and responding to legislative proposals, but the last few months have been a lot of gubernatorial directives. So it's a lot of uh, 
uh, administration directed policy. Usually that policy is coming from the legislature and the administration is executing it. But in an emergency declaration scenario, it kind of works um, sometimes in the opposite way. So it's been very sure. interesting. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit about all of that when we get to the legislature section. Amy Spear, the tourism. Uh, Amy, you used to be over at Stowe Association. You're new to the chamber gang, at least a little bit, um, but, but you're no stranger to the chamber world and uh, helping businesses and, and travel. Um, so give us a little bit of a, of a background for you and, and what's your take on all of this? Yeah, absolutely. I am a uh, Vermont tourist turned resident. Um, in 2012, I moved to Vermont and I worked in the town of Killington. I worked for both the Economic Development Office and I ran their Chamber of Commerce um, and then moved to the Stowe Area Association. So all things tourism for me since I've come to Vermont in 2012. Um, one thing that has certainly stood out in the tourism communications that, I, that have been going back and forth within the industry is you know, this has been a great example of Vermont resilience and um, the rising tide mentality that Vermont, and, uh, Vermont is often known for. Um, tourism industry wanting to come together and, and work together to make sure that when it's time to reopen again, you know, we're a united front to welcome guests. Yeah, great. And we'll talk a little about that. You just got done with Tourism Day. Uh, well, it seems like just done, but now it's five months ago. Uh, but a lot has gone on since then. So we'll talk a little bit about how do we reopen Vermont and, and the marketing pipeline. So again, I want to remind our viewers, if you do have questions, I'm monitoring um, Facebook. So don't mind me if I'm looking down or writing notes. Uh, our, our guests are the, the focus points for this telecast. I want to get right into the economy and general business. That's the couple questions for you. Um, we're all looking forward to reopening the business. And as we mentioned, um, right before I think we went live, that the governor just announced that 10 people um, in specific industries can now go back to work. What does it all look like? What's happening at the state level? What is the process and who's involved? How does, A, the governor make these decisions? And then where do we all serve a role in that? She's on mute. <laughs> There we go. Um, first of all, um, why don't we, you know, we think about how all businesses really want to um, reopen. We're all eager to get back to normal. However, I think this crisis is really going to tell us something, and that is that there is going to be a new normal, and none of us are really sure what that is. Governor Scott um, took a hard line early on, uh, did a lot of closures early on. And I will say that with all the business people that I've talked to in the last couple of months, many, many people are thankful that this is happening. Nobody loves the outcome, uh, but they understand that we've got to put Vermonters health first. So that's really what we've been focused on. But now as we start to think about sort of that looming May 15th date, uh, people are really looking forward to that. I think there's some pent up demand for the, the notion that maybe um, the order will be lifted on May 15th and we can all go back to work. And I want to assure anybody who's listening to this that that is not going to happen. Um, we are going to see, continue to see week by week, gradual reopening of various sectors of the economy. And I think if we look at um, what's happened to the construction industry in the last couple of weeks, that's a really good way of thinking about whatever industry you're in. So um, several weeks ago, the construction industry was the sort of the first industry to be thought of as, okay, you can go back to work. You can go back to work in small numbers, maybe two people, two people in a truck. It has to be outdoors. It has to be in unoccupied buildings. That was what we would call phase one of that. The following week, last week, we saw a reopening of phase two in those same outdoor landscaping construction where now that could be up to five people. And then just today, as you mentioned, Matt, the governor just had a press conference and now it's up to 10 people. So when you look at just the construction industry, you saw a little bit of opening in phase one, a little bit more opening in phase two and a little bit more in phase three. I don't know how many more phases, 
But that kind of scaled, slow opening is what we can expect in every industry. So last week, we saw that in manufacturing, that if you are manufacturing, regardless if you have a 50,000 square foot or a building or a small one, you can bring five people back to work. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it's now this week, 10 people. Um, and so I think when you, when you think about that, we're going to see that in multiple industries. Um, as we creep up to that May 15th date, I think we're all expecting to hear the governor say something about whether that's going to be continued or not. Yeah, as, as he mentions, the spigot model, which is just a quarter turn at a time, slow and steady. Um, I, I think there's a, I just want to say that when we think about that spigot model, a quarter turn at a time, I think when I first heard that, it felt like, well, there's four quarters. But I, I think it's a really a spigot that has one fifth at a time, one, yeah, one sixteenth at a time. I, I don't know what the right fraction is, but it's not just four chances at this. So no, I just want no. to be clear about that. Well, and, and so when we look at that, we had Teresa on last week uh, around HR. What are some of the guidances as they start to come on? You and I have talked, it seems like, a lot around uh, the, the uh, getting back to work and what are the processes and policies and protocols, even individually in our businesses, even in our chambers, that we need to be aware of. What, what are you seeing coming down uh, the pike? Well, I mean, I think Dr. Levine has said that, you know, social distancing is here to stay, right? So um, what does that mean? That's not just to the public, but it's to businesses. So if you are running a business, if you're thinking about, oh, gosh, when can I bring my workers back? One of the things that you can be doing right now is thinking about what can I do to bring those workers back? Well, social distancing is here to stay. Start thinking about configuring your workspace to thinking about six feet apart. I think that is something that we're going to see for a long time. Um, I think also uh, how you have regular uh, hand washing, hand sanitizing, uh, wipe downs of various communal areas in your business, really giving some thought to your uh, common areas, your conference rooms where people gather, your um, break rooms where people gather. Um, you might have a microwave multiple people are using or a refrigerator. Mm -hmm. That's going to have to change. So um, you don't need to wait for government guidance to figure out what to do. You can start puzzling over those things now and writing up a policy of how that's going to operate because that is different if you're in the restaurant business, if you're in the hotel and lodging business, if you're in an office like professional services, you know, lawyer, CPA, chamber of commerce, it's going to happen in every setting. Um, so you might as well begin thinking about that and addressing it. And then sort of the last piece that I think is here to stay is really what we've come to know as PPE. I, I don't think I have talked about PPE and PPP so much in my entire life. I never knew all of these things existed, but um, thinking about masks, um, and how you're going to uh, patrol that sort of in your work setting is something of importance. And then the last thing is that I think is, um, is coming. We haven't heard this. This is just sort of um, Betsy sort of listening very closely and trying to <laughs> figure out what the tea leaves say is, I think that employers are going to be asked, or I hesitate to use the word mandated, but are going to be encouraged to be taking temperatures of their employees before they report to work. Yeah. Um, and I think, Matt, you and I had a conversation about this. Well, where, where does one find an infrared thermometer that I can, you know, what does that look like in my business? Um, so, you know, spring, summer's coming, and let's say I have 150 employees, and they're all coming to work at the same time. There's a line. That's fine. What does it look like in winter? How long does that stay? Those are all things that you can be thinking. Through. Yeah, and, and Amy, I may go to you because you and I have talked, uh, and, and we've been on a couple of different task force, uh, forces in the last couple of weeks about more when we think of travel, when we think of lodging, when we think of restaurants. Um, are you seeing anything where uh, kind of fair and equitable uh, policy, whether it's governor uh, mandated or not, and it's just kind of the industry coming together saying, this is how we think restaurants, dining, 
attractions should open. Are you seeing anything? Are you hearing anything? Well, something that's really interesting, the Vermont Chamber is the state affiliate for American Hotel and Lodging Association and also the National Restaurant Association. So we're the trade group for restaurants and lodging. That's a statewide organization. And a lot of these groups are coming up with something that they call a promise. Um, so it's a promise that is given, it's you know looking at health and safety, but also social responsibility um, for owners and operators, employees, and then also patrons and guests. So that's really cropping up across the country. And there's a lot of entities that are issuing these promises, um, whether it's on behalf of restaurants or lodging. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that we can see an enhanced level of social responsibility as it relates to health and safety um, as we go forward and things are opened up, not only for in-state leisure travelers, but also the out-of-state leisure traveler. Yeah, yeah. Charles, I want to come to you in terms of some legislation uh, that is or isn't happening. Uh, while we're so focused on COVID, even on all of these telecasts, uh, what's going on over at the legislature that um, kind of you're paying attention to and you think small businesses and communities should as well? Yeah, so the legislature is operating in a remote capacity right now. Uh, far fewer committee meetings, but meetings are happening with each legislative committee on a weekly basis. Um, and I would also just add that people can access those committees by going to the legislature's website and following links uh, to watch their live stream YouTube activity. Um, so there hasn't been a lot of people doing that, um, but it would be great if more people were. Uh, so off the uh, out of the gate, they passed uh, changes to unemployment insurance, and we were a part of that effort. Uh, we worked uh, prior to the legislature closing to ensure that employers on employment experience ratings were not negatively impacted when they had to furlough employees because of the oil mandates or COVID-19. So there are some good things in that bill. Um, we can talk a little bit later about the federal UI changes, which are a mixed bag of good and potentially bad. Uh, but they're also working on uh, a workers' compensation bill that would expand workers' compensation coverage beyond just frontline workers. There was precedent there in past uh, pandemics where frontline workers were eligible in some instances for workers' comp. So this would make those changes a little bit more broad and include grocery store workers and other people that are exposed to the public on a weekly basis. Um, they passed uh, or advanced a bill that um, barred evictions from taking place. Uh, this was an interesting piece of legislation because the judicial branch had already uh, declared in their judicial emergency declaration that they would not be advancing any or hearing any eviction proceedings. So it was somewhat duplicative, but uh, the legislature felt that it was necessary, so they went ahead and did that anyway. And then I don't know if you, if all the listeners have heard about this, but there's been quite a bit of coverage about the essential worker pay bill. Um, this is a bill that uh, it started out as a $90 million bill. It was reduced to $60 million um, in two months instead of three months, but it would effectively uh, provide farmers, uh, pharmacists, trash collectors, dentists, uh, child care workers, homeless shelter staff, and others who are basically involved with public interaction on a daily basis, some supplemental pay to uh, recognize the fact that they're kind of on the front lines of responding to the pandemic. And it would also incent people to kind of remain in the workplace. Uh, we yeah. can go on and talk about the federal UI changes and how that's sort of created an interesting incentive structure, but I think that was a big part of why they're working on the essential pay as well. Well, yeah, and I'm sure, I mean, I, I think it's interesting as we have weeks go by, it seems like there are new um, themes emerging, and, and I just feel, and I don't know how the, the panel feels, but the theme of how we're going to pay for all of this feels like the theme of the week, especially I think what kind of kicked that off was the potential closure of the colleges, seeing how much that was going to cost to not close them. Uh, uh, I think UVM just came out today with how much they're going to be in the hole. So it seems like there's been triage, there's been health, there's been, it feels like last week was a little bit of UI and, and HR. And this week, it feels like we're starting to pull our head out of the stand and going, wait a minute, this is a lot of money. Um, how do you, I mean, yes, let's talk essential workers, let's talk UI, let's talk colleges. How does the panel feel? Or do you see any kind of silver lining in terms of finding uh, a pot of gold somewhere? So that pot of gold uh, doesn't exist at the state level. 
um, the, the, the pot of something um, exists in the Federal CARES Act, which provided a $1.25 billion for Vermont to use um, in, in response associated with COVID-19. There's kind of an ongoing discussion about the extent to which the state has the discretion to spend that money as they'd like. And there's sort of a sub conversation to that about what discretion the governor has to spend that as he sees fit and how much control the legislature has over that spending. Uh, but a lot of these problems and a lot of these funding solutions are, are drawing money or anticipating that they can draw money from that $1.25 billion. Um, and it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money for a state whose budget is somewhere around $6 billion annually, but it isn't an inexhaustible supply of money. Um, and that's definitely something that I think appropriators in the legislature are keeping in mind. Yeah. Do you figure, do you think that that was one stimulus? I mean, we know that President Trump passed 600 million, I think, last week or this week. I mean, that's the first of maybe a couple, or it's not even really stimulus, as I've said before. It's more about triage and keeping things afloat, and stimulus may be a couple months down the road. What are people's thoughts on more money coming this way and to every state, really? Um, so we've been in uh, pretty routine communication with uh, members of our congressional delegation. And the latest uh, from a conversation I had earlier in the week with Senator Leahy's office was the, the next anticipated round of funding would be more of a uh, relief package, a, a supplemental relief package. And stimulus would theoretically come after that. Um, so that's a pretty uh, unknown timeline at this point. But it, it looks, if I were to kind of guess at this, like the end of May for a next round of funding, and then mm -hmm. time after that this summer to sort of start stimulating the economy to renew normalized economic activity. Yeah. While we're while we're on kind of national, in. yeah, come on. Yep. I just I just wanted to jump in on that a little bit. The sort of the difference between relief and and stimulus and. I think um, this first amount of money that Charles is talking about, this 1.25 billion, I think initially people were thinking about that as you know, relief, something to pay for non-essential workers or the hospitals were starting to see really um, see huge deficits because certain parts of their, their business has been closed as well. Um, thinking about it in that way and sort of that relief in its own way is also a little bit of a stimulus, right? But I think what, you're, what we're starting to see is people reimagining the economy um, after this. So we've got to get through this, you know, is the 515 deadline open? When do restaurants open? When do lodging establishments open? When does my business reopen? Well, all of those things are like immediate and we have to think about the impact on people as well as businesses. And that's where most of the focus is. But I think some of us are really starting to pick up our heads a little bit and look a little further down the road and, and talk sure. about how can we use some of this massive amounts of stimulus money to reimagine the Vermont economy. Um, I wrote a piece last week about um, reimagining that and thinking about could Vermont become sort of that work from home capital of the universe, if you will. We have amazing outdoor recreation. We have, you know, world class uh, facilities here. Um, you know, and right now, if you're thinking about safety of your family, you know, where could you buy a small plot of land in almost any town? <laughs> it's in Vermont. So if you wanted to keep, you know, more than six feet between you and your neighbors, you could easily do that in Vermont. So I think there's a play there for us, but it's dependent on building out broadband in every community. And so um, today there's a there's an article that is talking about the legislature who's really looking at a $300 million plan to do that. So in the past, we've never had the luxury of being able to even talk about yeah. You know, gee, we've all known the broadband fix is $300 million, but like that's an incredible amount of money for Vermont where you get that. Well, now we have an option here and there's um, these conversations are happening at the federal level as well. So just put that out as like, you know, a lot that we talk about right now is not all that fun. That particular piece, there's a little bit of hope there for the Vermont economy. Yeah, well, and, and, and I think we know that part of the push on that internet and the last mile is the situation that we find our education in, which is if everybody's going, uh, being taught at home and not everybody has internet, then that's, uh, that's not fair. Uh, and I think we try to, we try to do fairness. What are other people's thoughts? I like this theme about reimagining. I think it's a good, hopeful discussion. 
what um, Amy or Charles, when you're reimagining or what you're seeing, you know, I think Charles, uh, in terms of the legislature, how fast and, and quick they're moving, and Amy from the travel and tourism, what is the future of Vermont? What is, what is a reimagined Vermont for you? I can jump in first on the tourism perspective. Um, you know, something that, you know, I believe is part of the Vermont ethos and particularly in the tourism realm is creativity and people having really big ideas that they find a way to make them work. Um, I think even how businesses are responding to COVID right now is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think there are two key things in the tourism world that will um, help to drive decision making of travelers as we look ahead. Um, one of them being the perception of safety and space. Um, to Betsy's point earlier about, hey, you can buy a plot of land in almost any Vermont town and ensure that you can have six feet between you and your neighbors versus a community where you might actually be able to touch your neighbor's house when you're in your bedroom. Um, and then I think there's something else that people are going to want to stay closer to home. There's a sense of safety with home. Uh, people are likely going to want to avoid getting on an airplane for an extended period of time. Uh, based on some recent consumer research, um, there were eight in 10 Americans saying that they're hesitating getting on an airplane or that they would approve of mandatory health screenings for flights. So when you're looking at numbers like that, and then you look at our drive market, I think when you look at that first point of um, safety and space that people are looking for, um, Vermont really is poised to, to take advantage of the other side of this and some creative thinking can come out of that as well. Yeah. Just a, a quick number on that drive market, just so folks know, when you think about where Vermont is situated with uh, Quebec, Montreal to the north of us, you think about New York, you think about uh, the lower um, New England states. We're within a day's drive of 80 million people. Um, and that means that somebody can get in their car and be here within eight hours, um, less, frankly. And um, that has always been the Vermont tourism uh, market core market has always been those 80 million people within a day's drive. Sure, we'll accept them from, you know, in the past, you know, internationally or, or from anywhere. But when we focus our marketing, it's always been in, in those areas. So I think that there's a strength that we've, our foundation has been built on that when we emerge from this, those 80 million people will be our target market. But guess what? They already were our target market. Yeah. So I think that that's good for us. Yeah, and, and probably a refocusing, you know, I think what we have all experienced, I know on this call, uh, and Betsy, you alluded to it a little bit earlier, is just, we can get a lot of stuff done now, because everybody, you know, it's a little bit like 9-11, it's a little bit like 2008, or even for Vermonters, Irene, where, you know, the, the, the kind of the political back and forth, whatever that may look like, uh, tends to subside during crisis, and we all tend to work together. To that end, and, and I don't know if you answered this fully, Charles, but when we get that $1.25 billion, what are you seeing in terms of these are the buckets in which it's going to be sprinkled into, or, or have we gotten that far yet in the legislature? Yeah, so there's a number of proposals right now, um, and that's kind of where there might be some areas of debate that emerge, and sort of this kumbaya moment, um, I could see it. Um, potentially crumbling a bit when we get down into the nitty gritty and where that's all spent. But mm -hmm. proposals out there right now, there's the three, potentially $300 billion proposal for broadband that Betsy mentioned, hazard pay that we talked about earlier, um, relief money for hospitals who are seeing obviously drops in uh, revenue because of the nature of the medical environment that they're uh, staffing right now. Uh, the state colleges are both the state colleges and the University of Vermont asking for money um, related to COVID-19 and, and any number of grant programs that various industries are also pursuing um, just to provide some relief and economic help uh, right now. So uh, there are there really is a growing list and it grows on a daily basis. So prioritization of that list is, is going to be kind of the next step here in the summer and late spring. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you, you bring up summer and, and 
spring and even fall. Amy, you know, we're on a couple of different um, meetings and task forces to kind of figure out how do we invite people back to Vermont when it's safe and ready to do that. Um, and uh, one, I hope that uh, in, in some of that stimulus package, there's some money set aside. And I think most Vermonters would agree, and especially a lot of our business members would agree that some of that money should be going towards marketing and tourism and reintroducing uh, perhaps a new Vermont to to many travelers, day trippers. What are you seeing in terms of uh, summer and fall? Obviously, weddings are huge in Vermont, and that industry has been hit incredibly, uh, as well as festivals and events. Where Vermont is well known for for New Yorkers and people from Boston that come on up, get away from the city in the summer, uh, and enjoy many of our farmers market festivals and uh, perhaps even a wedding. So, what are you seeing? What are you anticipating? Yeah, absolutely. So looking ahead, you know, we can, we're anticipating that as we approach May 15th, that we'll receive additional guidance on things like weddings, events, um, group sizes, et cetera. Um, but as Betsy mentioned earlier, you know, something to keep in mind is that social distancing and group size limits are likely something that's going to be around for some time. Um, and also likely tied to the phased um, reopening that we'll see that's related to the tourism industry. So really as May 15th approaches, you know, we're hopeful that we're going to be getting additional guidance um, on that because when you look at the wedding industry and the event industry in Vermont, those are significant, um, significant dollars and significant numbers of people that are coming to the state. Yeah. Yeah. And our small businesses. So, you know, I think I've been on my, soapbox about, you know, not only are there bailouts for some of the larger industries, and even I think for Vermont, we don't see that so much as the automobile industry or what we've bailed out in the past in terms of financial industry, but we are starting to see, as Charles says, you know, discuss the education industry, which which is big and is in some trouble. I'm hoping that uh, in the legislature and, and all of us around the, the telecast are focusing on dollars going to help our small businesses, you know, the, the ones that, uh, as I've talked to a couple, say, look, we get mud season. We know that we're down uh, February, March, April, maybe even May in Vermont. We are prepared for that. We're not prepared to go 365 days without any revenue. And so what are we going to do for that lodging or restaurants that have really depended on that? Um, I want to remind people that are watching on Facebook Live, we've got a good audience going. Um, if you have a question for uh, Betsy Bishop, President of the Vermont Chamber, Charles Martin, Director of Government Affairs at the Vermont Chamber, or Amy Spear, uh, v Vice President of Tourism with the Vermont Chamber, uh, please ask questions. That's what part of this is, is about. Um, we have about a couple minutes left, so let's talk a little bit about um, Amy. In terms of advocacy for the tourism industry, um, how can people who are watching help? You know, I've kind of, I just got off of my soapbox a little bit about pushing, putting pressure on the fact that let's remember what the Vermont backbone is and it's small business. It's always their relief for small businesses, especially in the travel and tourism, which tends to make up a lot of small businesses here. What, what are other ways, and, and anybody can kind of chime in here, Betsy, Charles, what are ways that people can participate and help in this democratic process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one thing that, you know, I think that we always say in um, out of the Vermont Chamber, you know, we've got a team of lobbyists, but some of the strongest advocacy are people in your community talking to your elected officials, telling them why is tourism marketing important to you? Why is targeted relief in the form of forgivable loans or grants important to your business? Um, you know, one of the groups that Matt and I are sitting on are working on a collaborative and focused approach to tourism marketing, um, the recovery angle on that. And, you know, looking at that, one thing is the importance to ensure that tourism is a priority for recovery efforts. So that's kind of the tourism lens of things um, as we're looking at that. But we always say stay in contact with your, your elected official and tell them what is important to you um, because you're the voice um, in your community to them. And yeah. I'm sure Charles and Betsy have 
Well, yeah, I want to hear from Charles. We, we kind of started his segment with what should we be uh, knowing that's going on as we're paying attention to COVID. What are some things coming down the pipeline, Charles, that um, the citizens and, and community should know about? Yeah, so I think in particular, an area where there's a little bit of concern um, are potential changes to workers' compensation. Um, premiums have traditionally for a regular business that isn't in the business of doing frontline emergency work have never accounted for a pandemic. Um, and the potential for premium increases if we did have a widespread workers' compensation um, expansion could be uh, significant. And we're working right now, I'm working with national partners to actually track down a full cost estimate on what that might look like. So I could provide that to the legislature. Um, but it really is an area where it's, it's very well-intentioned legislation, completely understand where it comes from. But we try to do the you know task of reminding legislators that there is a secondary cost and businesses are the ones eating that cost when we, when we advance legislation like this. Yeah, um, that's the other thing that um, business members who are watching, but also maybe community members should just be, you know, what is what's on the horizon here for um, summer and fall for Vermont? Right. So to, to make sure um, your folks who are listening understand that there is an avenue for you, if you've got an idea about reopening, something that we should think about, um, something that <clears throat> you wish you could get directly to the governor or a legislator, you know, there's lots of different avenues for that, but the governor has built four restart teams and these teams are looking at industry and how to reopen. They're taking input from wide swaths of people. If you're not in touch with that, your first point of contact should be Matt at the, at the chamber um, and really ask him if he's got to bring that to us, we can be a good conduit as well. Um, Amy's involved with a couple of restart teams around lodging and tourism. Um, we have a manufacturing guy who's, who's in touch on the manufacturing side. We're talking about all of these pieces. So if you have input, knowledge, or even questions about when is this going to happen or how is this going to happen, that's, that's, those are the best stairs to, to step up into that conversation. As far as summer and fall goes, I think we're going to see uh, a slow reopening of the economy. I think we're going to see, um, frankly, I'm going to see uh, the hospitality community go last in opening. Um, any high-touch businesses, uh, uh, hair salons, nail techs, masseuse, uh, gyms, those types of high-touch, non-medical things are going to go last. They went first. If you if you think about how how this started, is those high touch places went first. So um, for all of us hoping to get a haircut soon, um, it, you're going to have to figure out with YouTube how to do that on your own for a little bit. Um, so, but I think we're really starting to see um, restaurants adapt to curbside call in. Um, I, I would have never predicted that we'd be able to get a margarita on the curb and take it to go in a sippy cup. Never, never. Life is grand. So there's some some innovation happening in in that realm as well. So um, I think some of those things are going to take a little bit longer. I don't think throughout the whole summer. Um, but also then once they're opening, thinking about welcoming back folks from New York and Massachusetts who are really hard hit COVID places. Is that what we want? And how do we go about doing that in a way to protect Vermonters uh, health as well? So I think all of those things will be balancing with us through the summer. Great. Well, uh, I want to give one last opportunity for anybody on Facebook, if you're watching, uh, to ask a question. I'll, I'll have one, one last question I'd like to ask. Uh, most of my panelists every time we do this is, what are you doing personally to handle stress? And I think we've got a unique panel here that can really understand. I mean, I, we're, we're talking with businesses every day and, and, you know, besides maybe the healthcare workers that are really dealing with the front line of the disease and the virus, um, our small businesses are just kind of pulling their hair out and, um, and I think are, are just trying, I mean, they're trying so darn hard to find silver linings and as Betsy said, you know, bottling margaritas and God bless them for their innovation. Uh, I think that's for me an encouragement that when push comes to shove, necessity breeds innovation. And, and we've seen a lot of our businesses, even here in Bennington County, uh, kind of adapt and, and innovate. But what, in terms of how are you all dealing with stress and do you have any key tips or tactics that, that you're 
that you would recommend for our viewers? I'll go first. Um, personally, um, I'm eating more, <laughs> which is not good. But on the flip side of that, I'm exercising more. So uh, I've got a bunch of folks at the office that are uh, pushing uh, to do push-up challenges and get out and enjoy your backyard, your trails. I mean, we live in a place where there is awesome recreation. So take advantage of that. Um, I also, so I think sort of that is good for your mental health is to, to be able to um, think about that and reach out and touch somebody digitally. Um, don't let um, that divide, that personal divide, keep dividing you. There are ways to connect that you can do um, that maybe not quite the same as being in the same room, but there are ways to do that. So those would be my suggestions. Yeah, I think I would second uh, what Betsy said about exercise and also to the speaking with people who aren't maybe even traditionally in your orbit um, or relevant to the work you're doing on a daily basis. I haven't spoken, you know, with a lot of the people I see on a daily basis in the, in the state house um, in the last couple of weeks, but everyone that I have called, whether or not I have business to discuss with them or just want to shoot the breeze, has really been thrilled, you know, that we could catch up and just take a moment to step back from it all and uh, speak to one another. And, Way. So yeah, yeah, I definitely would encourage people to do that. And, and Charles, I'm sure just like many of us, I'm hopping on calls in personal time that I wouldn't have normally hopped on or Zoom calls. You know, I have college friends that will now want to do a Zoom thing and, uh, and, and, and across the board and family members that, you know, you might see on Thanksgiving and, and Christmas and now they want to do a Zoom call. So uh, yeah, they're if we're not seeing our, our, our normal uh, people, although I think many of us are via Zoom, I think we're also getting a, a huge uh, a boost in terms of our personal people as well. Amy, for you, stress, how do you relieve it? Yeah, so I spend as much time as I can outside. Um, I would say my husband and I seem to like to make major life decisions um, amidst a little bit of chaos. So we actually closed on a house and moved right before everything in Vermont shut down. So taking the time, feeling grateful, um, staying outside. Um, and I do have a 10 month old that I love. I was to gonna say, you have, a, you have a ball of stress relief that, um, yeah, that, yeah. Has, that has actually hopped on a couple of our task force calls. Yes, she uh, she's a, likes to weigh, she's an entertainer and uh, she loves to laugh. So that's a way to lighten the mood and, um, keep things going and entertained. Great. Well, hey, before we go, I want to make sure uh, that we've hit everything that you all three feel is important for small businesses and communities throughout Vermont. Uh, anything we left off or any just closing comments, why don't we start with uh, Charles, we'll go to Amy, and then we'll finish with the president, Betsy Bishop. Yeah, I would just encourage people to, uh, if they do have the time, and I know business owners especially are just tremendously busy right now trying to navigate all the relief programs that are coming down the pike, but if they do have the time to tune into some of the legislative proceedings that are going on and definitely continue to call your legislator and advocate for whatever your position is, because there's a lot of noise right now, um, and it's easy to get kind of left behind in the conversation if you're not reminding your legislator of your needs and you know, that you're there and you're listening and that they are the one position to help you. Amy? Now I'll take the um, tourism lens. Something that I'm really excited to be working on is kind of a tourism recovery group. Um, this has been a major and evolving challenge for the tourism industry. Uh, but bringing people together to collaborate on uh, recovery marketing strategies is really exciting. Um, and really um, working on something that can be a unified brand that industry partners can leverage via a toolkit. Um, I would say that's a silver lining right now and something that I'm really enjoying working on. Matt, you're on that group with me. And, you know, the hospitality sector has been hit really hard and finding a way to unify and provide tools on the other side of this will be um, to a benefit to everybody as there's a lot of noise when travel opens up again. Yeah. And Betsy? I would say that um, I would encourage people not to forget their chambers. Um, 
you know, this is when we excel. This is what we do. Two of the main benefits that we always have is providing you solid, knowledgeable, thoughtful information and advocating on your behalf. I know Matt is doing that in the Bennington County region, both North and South Shire. Um, we're certainly doing it all over the state. Um, if you feel like you're not being represented or your voice isn't being heard, certainly reach out, send an, send an email, um, call us where, you know, all you have to do is Google us, you'll find us um, and, and use us to your advantage. This is, this is what we were built for. Um, and if you know that your chamber is doing something that um, you think, wow, that was great, take a minute and, and just send a quick email and say thanks, not just to your chamber, but to anybody. Right now, we could all use a little bit more kindness. So um, I will just leave you by thinking, you know, be kind to yourself and be kind to others. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I would say it's one of the silver linings that I know myself and my staff have, have heard from them. I think, uh, you know, that we've had many members reach out to us. I'm sure Betsy, you have, and Charles and Amy, just, you know, very thoughtful. Um, and, and that is the Vermont spirit. Uh, you know, I don't think you find that other places. So uh, we are so appreciative to continue to serve our members with telecast and other things. And I know uh, the Vermont Chamber is as well. So on behalf of CAT TV, we want to thank them for broadcasting live. Uh, the Vermont Chamber, who is with us today in the Southwestern Vermont Chamber of Commerce. I want to wish everybody a very happy first day of May, a very good weekend. Make sure you get outside. And as Bessie says, be kind to one another. Thank you so much. Thank you.